All right. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the first webinar of our new haematology series at Mind the Bleep. Uh, my name is Delphine, and I, along with Sarah, the haematology leads at Mind the Bleep. Today, we are incredibly lucky to have um, Dr. James Clark, uh, he's a post CCT haemophilia research fellow at the East Kent University Hospitals. Um, he will be speaking to us today on clotting. Um, this is an incredibly important topic and something that one encounters every day as a junior doctor. So something really important to get your heads around early. Um, please add any questions during the talk to the chat. And if time permits, we will ask James to go through these at the end. Brilliant. James, whenever you're ready, you can. Thank you. Thank you, Delphine and Sarah. Hi, everybody. Um, so I hope that you can see me. If there's anything problems, please do flag up halfway through, uh, whenever there's any issues. So I wanted to spend some time today just going through the very basics, really, of clotting, because it's something that I think lots of people come out of medical school uh, when they hit the, the shop floor, being very unsure what's actually what actually matters day to day when it comes to patients, and also when things get a little bit more complicated, what they should be doing to to address that. So, I want to sort of tackle that in a sort of systematic way. So, the first thing I wanted to look at was the very basics really of this recap of how clotting occurs and what the processes and st stages are, and then move forward to understand a little bit about that scary clotting cascade, and then uh, sort of assign that a little bit to the clotting tests that we do most frequently on the clotting screen, and then use that to tackle some basics and then hopefully some more complex cases going forward. Um, and hopefully that'll give you a decent understanding of uh, how useful a test it is, but also how to, how to tackle it when it when something comes up abnormal. So when a clot forms, um, there's lots of stages, surprising number really. And the first thing that happens is that when there's, we talk about sort of uh, vessel wall injury or tissue injury, there will be vasoconstriction or vascular spasm um, sort of dealt with by nitric oxide um, that stops blood flowing or slows blood flowing to that area to limit hemorrhage. And then there's this thing called primary hemostasis, where there's the formation of a platelet plug. And that happens in a few stages. Um, the first thing is where platelets, which are going around circulation, adhere to the damaged endothelium, so the vessel wall that's damaged, and then they activate. So they, they degranulate, release their cytokines and everything else, and activate, changing their straight structure. And that allows platelets to stick together and that forms a platelet plug through platelet aggregation. And after, once that platelet plug's in place, hopefully most of the blood flow is starting to, to stem and it's now time to move forward to sort of healing the area. And that's where secondary hemostasis really does come in, um, where you have what we classically think of as a clotting cascade. And it's all to do with forming a fibrin mesh forming that safe sort of scab, for want of a better word, to a uh, blood clot um, to allow wound healing and, and to, to, to allow the, the, the hemorrhage to be fully dealt with. And that has to be a really tightly regulated process. Most of the clotting cascade and everything else around it is there to keep that process in check and happening at the right place and the right time. Because if it doesn't, then things are really bad for the human body. And as part of that process of control, you also want a, a mechanism by which the fibrin mesh will be broken down or fibrinolysis afterwards to uh, limit the hemostatic process to the site of injury, but also to remove any clot and to keep the hemostasis in balance going forward. Um, so that's a major component of hemostasis to be aware of. When we think of secondary hemostasis, we're increasingly moving away from the clotting cascade as that linear model that you have learned at medical school because things in the human body are never as simple as we would like them to be. Um, there's lots of cross-linking, sort of uh, feedback loops, both negative and positive, inhibition uh, and promotion, which can be really sort of entwined and difficult to disentangle. But in summation, we're moving to this cell-based model, which is all about this process of thrombin generation. Now, thrombin is factor two um, and basically activates that process of fibrin to fibrinogen. Uh, but 
it's about keeping that in check. But we will for today, because it's handy for understanding the tests that we do, we're going to go back to the classic clotting cascade to help us understand what those tests may indicate as a sort of structure for moving forward. Now, when we look at this, I think most people put their heads back in horror at the thought of it all because it's a bewildering complex of Roman numerals and numbers and everything else. And it's just it's just unfair, really, isn't it? It's really bizarre. And it really is a sign of the historical precedent that we have and we have to work with to understand the body of work that's gone before. And they were named in order of them being found um, and things were removed over time when it became clear that they were something else. So you may notice that there's no factor four and no factor six because it's understood now that this process happens on a phospholipid bilayer on the surface of platelets actually. Um, and that's factor four. And then there's also the fact that calcium is heavily involved in allowing the process to work, as you can see from this diagram, and that's factor six. So, you know, it's a really unfair thing to get your head around, but unfortunately we are stuck with it. So to a large extent, we have to sort of bear with it. Um, and then we can move forward to, to understanding this pathway. Now, at the bottom, we can see thrombin being two, and it's activated two, and that is what allows fibrinogen to go to fibrin and form that polymerized fibrin mesh. Everything else is about keeping that under control. So we're gonna start on the brown side, the right-hand side here, the extrinsic pathway, which is always useful to think about because that's where the outside injury comes in. And what we're saying there is that there's injury to a vessel wall, to tissue, and tissue factor is released. And that is what gets the ball rolling. Activate, it gets activated seven to start working to activate the common pathway, so 10, 5, 2, and you get your fibrin mesh. And importantly there, the only thing that's really involved other than tissue factor, which is the propagation, is factor 7. So there's only one real one involved exclusively in the extrinsic pathway. And factor 7 has the shortest half-life. It's the first thing to be degraded when people are unwell because it's used up quite quickly. Um, and it's almost always something that only goes down in consequence to something else. Very rarely do you have a person who doesn't produce much factor seven um, because inherited bleeding disorders due to low factor seven disorders seven are almost universally recessive and, com and confined to very small areas of the world. So it's very rare to encounter a congenital inherited factor seven deficiency. So when you've got a, an extrinsic pathway defect, it's almost certainly going to be you know, a medication or a situation that the patient's in. And then we move across to the other side, which is a lot more interesting to hematologists because it, it's where all those inherited bleeding disorders come from, really, uh, that side of things. So you can see at the top, we've got the, what we call the contact factors right at the top which are um, somewhat to do with the activation. We'll come back to those later. And then you have this sequence of 12 activating, 11 activating, nine. Now 12 isn't really involved in that because it can be activated in other ways. So 12 is not normally something that we worry about too much. But we've got factor 11, activating nine, activating eight with um, von, Willebrand's, von Willebrand's, and then that activates the column pathway we've always talked about, gets the thrombin burst and you get your fibrin. So it, it is, when you break it down, quite straightforward to understand and to understand. Now, factor 13 is its own thing, and we're not going to really touch on that today because it doesn't actually alter our clotting test. It's its own individual thing, and that's more going on history, okay? Um, and fibrinogen is obviously a key component of all this. We'll come on to that shortly. So when we're trying to tie in our test, this is very much a cascade built around the testing that we did. There's a huge amount of history to all of this, and a lot of it comes down to the drugs that we use. We actually developed tests such as Quick's test, which then became uh, prothrombin time, which then became an, uh, an INR, mainly to monitor stuff like warfarin, to monitor the effects of drugs. And then they've been used over time to understand other aspects of things. We'll talk you through how they work today. And the PT, and when you look at a clotting, when you take a blue top bottle and you send it to the lab, you'll get a common panel of things back to you, depending on what you ask for. The most common thing will be a prothrombin time or a PT, which is looking at the extrinsic pathway, really, but alongside the common pathway factors. And it's a really straightforward test. 
okay? What we're basically doing is trying our best to simulate the body to assess, you know, secondary hemostasis at that level. So what we're doing is we're getting the plasma without platelets. So we're ignoring primary hemostasis completely. And we're just getting the plasma, which is chock full of all those factors. And we're then giving tissue factor, which you may recall from this diagram here, is the activator of the extrinsic pathway. And the extrinsic pathway is much more keenly activated than the uh, intrinsic pathway. So when you have tissue factor, the only thing that you'll really get a measure of is the extrinsic side. And then you add in something else to emulate the human body. So you add in some phospholipid, so the plate, so a surface to act on. You emulate it further by incubating the entire thing at 37 degrees Celsius or body temperature, and you add in calcium. Now, the reason you've done that is when you take the blue top bottle, you have calcium, you have a citrated tube, which immediately, as soon as the blood hits that, it leaches all the calcium out of that sample. And without calcium, the clotting cannot happen. So it halts that process at the time that there's a sufficient mixing of those. And that's why the lab are so keen that the blue top bottle is filled to the right line. Because if you have too much blood, then there's too much, cal there's not enough calcium and you'll get a, an altered, altered, altered test result. And if there's too little, you get a similar artifact. So that's why the lab are very hot on saying it's not been filled correctly. We can't run it because they know if they run it, they'll just get a really spurious result for you. and It'll help no one. So they have emulated the human body. They've got the plasma, the tissue factor, the phospholipid, and they've got it at human body temperature and they add back in the calcium, which starts the, the stopwatch again. And literally, that's what they used to do was they started the stopwatch and waited until a clot formed. And that was the prothrombin time. So it's a really simple test in many ways. It's now all automated, but this is the principle of it. And it allows you to look at that entire extrinsic pathway. It does rely on having factors 10, 5, and 2, and also your fibrinogen adequate. But it can be a good marker because if it's, if it's only the PT that's prolonged, it's normally just the fact that your factor 7 is low. And that can be for all sorts of reasons. So it can be a, that you've got a vitamin K deficiency, remembering that the, you've got a whole bunch of vitamin K dependent factors. Um, and, don't, and vitamin K comes from the German coagulans. So it's been well known for a long time that K is involved in the clotting pathway. Um, so if you're deficient because of diet or other reasons, you will fail to have a good factor seven, which is a vitamin K. So it's two, seven, nine, and 10, which are your clotting factors that are vitamin K dependent. And if you emulate that with a vitamin K antagonist, such as warfarin, you'll get a similar picture. In liver disease, which produces a lot of factors, then that will also derange things. But this is both sides of the coin as well, because don't forget that 2, 7, 9 and 10 will include both, both the intrinsic and the extrinsic. If you use other drugs, so antithrombin inhibitors, very high concentrations of heparin or some factor 10 inhibitors, if you don't have any fibrinogen, you'll be grossly prolonged. If you have a combination, rarely factor 5 and 8 can be absorbed together, come together, and also very rarely chromosomal and abnormalities of vitamin K metabolism, but those are rare as hen's teeth. And so it's a very simple test that tells you that, basically. Um, and s some people worry going the other way if the pt is very quick so it's a, a low time that that may be significant and normally for the prothrombin time it only really happens if we give them a medication such as recombinant 7a so we're giving them a fake vitamin K, vitamin um sorry fake factor seven um which will cause a shorter time because it's happening so fast okay and then we have the other the uh, our test of the intrinsic pathway so this is the activated partial thromboplastin time, which is a very similar test in so many ways, because we take platelet poor plasma, so we're ignoring primary hemostasis and we're just looking at secondary. And this time we don't want to get the extrinsic pathway activated at all. So we don't. We leave out the um, tissue factor and we add in an activator, like a contact factor, such as um, silica, which is the most common one. And then we do the same things. We add in phospholipid, we incubate at 37 degrees C, and we add back in the calcium and record the clotting time um, for a simple thing. Obviously, again, it's automated. And this one, if you have a pattern where 
the APTT is prolonged and the PT isn't, then you may be looking at a factor deficiency. And these ones are a little bit more, it's still quite rare, but still can be very low if you have an inherited bleeding deficiency, a bleeding disorder. So you may have a low factor 8, you may have a low factor 9, 11, and rarely a 12, which alters your um, APTT because it's low, but doesn't actually lead to any clinically significant bleeding because there's uh, other bypassing pits. It, very rarely you can have a contact factor deficiency, and that's why we test the factors. If they're normal, we sort of disregard it. And then, confusingly, it can also be deranged for other reasons, being a clotting factor inhibitor. And what we mean by this is that there's an antibody in the circulation that's bound to this, this um, the thing that we're testing here, and it interferes with our test. It doesn't mean that the blood is um, clotting, it is lacking its ability to clot. It doesn't mean the factors are low. It just means that something's getting in the way of our test. And that's what you may encounter with something called a lupus anticoagulant, which is one of these acquired clotting factor inhibitors. Now, the lupus is one of the most misnamed things. It is more common in people with autoimmune disease, and it was first identified in someone with lupus, but it's not selective for lupus. It doesn't mean that you've got lupus in any way. And it's also not an anticoagulant. It prolongs the APTT, but actually in the body, it's a, it's a, a prothrombotic thing to the point where, where if you have a persistently positive lupus anticoagulant and you're clotting a lot, and you're having lots of thrombosis, you have something called antiphospholipid syndrome, of which a lupus anticoagulant is one. Um, and that is a very prothrombotic disorder. And it's about using these tests to try and figure out what the difference is. And if they're both prolonged, it's the same list again, where it's vitamin K deficiency or liver disease or something else going on. And if it's short, i.e. you've got a, a, a low time, then you may be dealing with an acute phase response because the big part of it is factor eight, which is an acute phase reactant. It goes up when your body is stressed. And so if you've got lots of factor eight, your APTT will actually um, allow a clot to form much faster in this test. Um, one of the tests that we will often ask for when we're trying to distinguish in a prolonged APTT if this is a true factor deficiency or if there's an inhibitor interfering with our test would be to do something called a 50-50 mix. And this is quite a simple test, really. We run the APTT, and if it's prolonged, you mix a ratio of 1 to 1 or 50-50 of the patient's platelet pore plasma, and some reference plasma that we know has an adequate supply of factors. It's not low in anything. And if the, the lower one here, if the factors are present, are low, and you mix the replacement factors in from the reference plasma, the APTT, when you rerun it on that mixed sample, will normalize or near normalize, showing that the patient sample was very low in the factors. And then you can do some further testing to figure out which one it is. If, however, there's an antibody or an inhibitor in the way, then that will continue acting on both the patient's factor, but also the reference samples plasma. So the uh, APTT will remain prolonged. So if there's a non-correcting 50-50 mix, we know that we're dealing with a lupus or something similar, and it's probably not a significant bleeding concern, and we need to go looking down that line. And it's, it sort of gives us a very different picture about what's going on with that test. There are some other tests that we can sometimes do, and you may see these from time to time, such as a thrombin time, where we do the same test again, but we add just thrombin in and see how quickly it clots. And this is quite a good measure of quite low down the pathway. How quickly can it clot? It needs nothing above it to work. It just needs a bit of fibrinogen and everything else at the lower end intact. And so if the fibrinogen is low, if there's liver disease or there's something going on where there's no clotting factors at all from like lip DIC or cancer, then you will end up with a prolonged uh, thrombin time. It's also very good at picking up heparin, which will continue to act on it So because it acts on two as well. So um, you, 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 that's a good way of distinguishing sometimes. If the thrombin time is very prolonged, then you may be dealing with heparin. And heparin is always a big worry here because lots of samples are taken from lines, uh, heparinized lines or anything else, and you worry that you're contaminating your sample with a drug directly into the sample. And so we also use other correction tests that you may see, um, such as a reptilase time derived from reptiles. Um, and if it corrects, uh, it basically is heparin insensitive, so it confirms heparin contamination. Other 
trust to use something like a 1% protamine correction or other things, most labs, all, all labs really, will have a heparin correction test just to make sure it's not a drug causing their issue. And then that we follow quite an algorithmic approach really when we have a prolonged PT or APTT, which normally with a prolonged th prothrombin time, we're a bit worried about a, a, either an inhibitor or if there's a factor deficiency. And so we'll mix to the 50-50 mix. And if it corrects, we can think about the clinical picture because if they're on warfarin or anything else, um, then we got, we've got an answer. We wouldn't do any further testing. But if we don't have a clear answer, we might start thinking, do we need to start testing some factors? But if it doesn't correct, then we'll go looking for a, a, an inhibitor of some form. Whereas the prolonged APT has a bit more complexity in it because we worry a bit more about drugs such as heparin causing the issue. We worry more about a range of um, factor deficiencies. We worry about um, things like DIC. We worry about lupus. So there's a bit more of an algorithmic way of approaching it, which is normally to check there's no contamination with a drug do some mixing studies and go down the route of a lupus anticoagulant or a factor deficiency, or go down the route of looking for other problems like global problems or common pathway problems. Um, an INR, by the way, is um, basically just a, norm, a, a um, prothrombin time put against an international standard. Back in the day, when different labs were using different reagents, the prothrombin time ranges and what was normal would vary from lab to lab to lab. And if you had someone on warfarin who was moving from lab to lab to lab, you wanted them to have a standard. So they basically put their, their ranges against an international standard and normalized to that ratio. So that's why it's called an international normalized ratio. So it's a fancy way of saying how close is that to normal so that we can compare between labs. So an INR is only useful for warfarin and because of historical precedent in liver disease. Otherwise, we should be using PT and APTT. And nowadays, almost all my labs have a very similar reference range. Um, there is the impact of anticoagulants, which I wanted to touch on, um, because people worry about them so much and where they affect the pathway and everything else. So the one you really need to know is vitamin K antagonists, which is mainly warfarin. Um, which affects the vitamin K dependent factor. So that's two, seven, nine, and 10. And that's a mantra that you just need to know. There's a range of mnemonics out there. And I'd recommend, you know, because it does come up quite heavily in exams and elsewhere in life. We're using more and more drugs such as DOAC, so direct oral anticoagulant drugs like rivaroxaban, apixaban, doxaban, those are the most common ones. And they act mainly on factor 10A. That's why they've got the XA in them. Um, and they affect depending on the lab's reagents and everything else um, they affect the PT and APT to varying lengths and increasingly people are moving to either a pragmatic approach of how long has it been in their system and just treating if they need to um, and reversing if needed or using um, specialist levels to, to ascertain um, what how, how active those drugs are in circulation from a other one is the bigger tram, which acts on 2A, so it's a different mechanism. That's on thrombin directly, and it will have a grossly prolonged thrombin time. That's a good way of always teasing it out. Um, and then you've got unfractionated heparin, which affects both 10 and 2A. You've got low molecular heparin, which, depending on the drug you've got, affects 10 and 2A variably. And then fondoparinux, which is almost exclusively via the action of antithrombin, um, on 10A. And they give you a prolonged APTT product predominantly. So we need to sort of try this out now. I've got about 35 minutes to go through these examples and then some cases. Um, so I hope that everyone's on board so far. There's nothing, I hope nothing's come up in the chat. There's any problems, people following along. Um, I think it's quite handy to have an idea for common conditions and how that would present in terms of the, the range of tests that you have. So across the top here, we've got our prothrombin time, our activated partial thromboplastin time, our thrombin time, and then the platelets, a blood film, a bleeding time. Now, this is a very old test that isn't used anymore at all, as far as I'm aware, around the country. Um, and it's, effect, it's a test of primary hemostasis where people used to do a little score on the skin and see how long it took, literally a stopwatch, to see how long people stopped, stopped bleeding as, effect of, uh, as a measure of... Um, primary hemostasis, but it was a really rubbish test. It didn't it had very little validity and we don't use it anymore. The reason I put it in is that about, God, five to 10 years ago when I was doing my 
um, exams, it came up and I was very miffed about it and I have been ever since. So I ensure that everyone is aware of what it's testing and, and how it would affect, be affected in different conditions just in case it ever comes up. And then we've got factor eight, nine and von Willebrand factor. I'm going to go through these and then we can perhaps, if it's possible, have some interaction on the cases, um, but we'll see. So when it comes to ITP, this is a thing where it's called immune thrombocytopenia. Um, the old name, old name was immune thrombocytopenia purpura, but we've removed the purpura because not everyone gets purpura. And this is a problem purely of platelets. So the platelet count goes very low from immune destruction and therefore the the secondary hemostasis is untouched. So your PT, APT, thrombin time, eight, nine, and one with will be completely normal, but the platelet count will be low or even very, very low in single digits. And when you look under the microscope, because it's a diagnosis of exclusion, you won't, you'll see very low platelet numbers and possibly some very large platelets, some giant platelets. If warfarin's on board, this is gonna affect secondary hemostasis, excepting the, the clotting cascade. So it's gonna cause your prothrombin time, and therefore your INR to be prolonged. And it'll also affect your APTT because it's a test of both of those. Um, thrombin time is normally grossly normal because it doesn't affect thrombin at the right of the, uh, too much at the bottom. Um, the platelets will be unaffected. The film will be unaffected. The bleeding time, although this is not strictly true because obviously anyone who's on any anticoagulant can bleed a bit longer, as a strict measure of primary hemostasis, your bleeding time will be unaffected and your factors will be unaffected. Heparin would normally affect the APTT more. They can be, in particularly very, very high doses, it can affect the thrombin generation and affect two, but normally it's very subtle. But it can affect your thrombin time, so that's the pattern you'd expect, a very prolonged APTT, a high thrombin time, and then you'd probably do an extra test about heparin contamination, such as um, you know, the Repslase time or something else, and that would give you an idea of what's going on, and everything else would be normal. In terms of um, the, um, okay. in terms of um, when you're on a heparin infusion, you might want to see how strong the effect is, and so you can do an APTT ratio. So that's followed by an R, which is quite uncommon to see outside of a heparin infusion monitoring. And it just tells you compared to a baseline where you're up to. Hemophilia A is a condition. And it's quite, again, historical precedent. Hemophilia A just means congenital deficiency of factor eight. You can get acquired hemophilias where that factor is very low because there's an, an antibody acting on that. But we're talking about congenital hemophilia here. And because it's affecting only factor eight, your prothrombin time is untouched. Your APTT will be prolonged. And when you do the 50-50 mix, given there's a factor deficiency, it will be correctable. And the rest of the tests will be normal apart from when you do a direct test of the factor eight level, and that will be low. And then hemophilia B, also known as Christmas disease, good time of year, um, is the same thing apart from it's affecting factor nine, and the same pattern occurs with the, re the relevant factor being low. TTP, or um, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, another um, sort of historical remnant, is a very scary diagnosis. It's a hematological emergency. And in this condition, it is um, uh, where there is, um, we'll come into this later, a, um, very, a, a deficiency of an enzyme that leads to very long multimer strands of something called von Willebrand that clogs up the microvasculature. So all the cells going through, the red cells, get shorn to pieces. So you get lots and lots of fragments everywhere. Um, and, that cons and that process also consumes pa platelets. And there, in that court, those clumps of thrombotic material can cause stroke, heart attacks, renal failure, and death normally within 24 hours or to 48 hours in about 90% of cases. So it's definitely something to get on top of. But it doesn't affect secondary hemostasis. So the clotting screen is untouched, but the platelet count is very low and there's fragments and the bleeding time would be prolonged in that condition. Von Willebrand's disease, it's a bit unusual in the sense that this is von Willebrand's is the linchpin between platelets acting and also factor eight working well. So this is a bit of a mixed picture between primary and secondary hemostasis. And it depends on how low the level is, but you can get normal clotting screens. Um, 
and so the PT and the PT, APT can be normal. Rarely it can be um, prolonged, or it can be in, in more extreme variants. The platelet count is normally normal, except some subtypes where the platelet count is, is lower. The film will be normal, and because it's, uh, it's involved in the primary hemostasis, the bleeding time is prolonged. And then von Willebrand has such a close interaction with eight that that's normally a bit low, and the von Willebrand's factor is very low. DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, is a condition where the entire process has gone out of control. So clotting is happening without any feedback loops. It's just happening in an uncontrolled fashion. So all of the platelets and all of the clotting factors get consumed where the body's got that activated, leaving to causing clots in some areas. And then in everywhere else, there's not enough platelets or factors to go around. So you end up with a coagulopathy alongside sometimes a thrombotic predisposition. And normally this is because there's an uncontrolled inflammatory condition on board like sepsis or cancer. And so the clotting screen is grossly deranged. The platelets are low. Everything has gone wrong. The factor levels are very low because everything's been consumed. Um, and as my old professor said, this used to be death is coming. It's a, a, a very poor prognostic sign. OK. Right. Um, I don't know quite how we're going to do this. Delphin, can people contribute from the chat or um, do, should I just go through the cases and ex as an example? So I think they can contribute through um, text on the chat, as far as I'm aware, but I okay. don't think they can turn they that audio talk. on. No, that's fine. Yeah. Um, why don't we go through the cases then rather than asking people to type? But perhaps if there's anything that's not clear from these cases, or if there's cases that they've had, because uh, if I if I rattled through them, we should have some time for some extra questions at the end. Um, perhaps they can talk about cases that they've seen and how that was interpreted so that we can understand those. Yeah. So case one um, is a fairly standard one from our, my perspective, where you have a three-year-old girl who's been referred into the hematology clinic with a history of easy bruising. And obviously you want to get a measure of the full history and examination because children bruise all the time because they're very active. But equally, if it's disproportionate bleeding, then you might want to assess them using something like a, a bleeding assessment tool of which the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, the ISDH, has a bleeding assessment tool or a BAT, which is quite good at picking up some, some disorders, particularly von Willebrand disease. And so you want to assess both primary and secondary hemostasis. So looking at primary hemostasis, you look down, um, you do a full blood count and there's a normal count and you look down the microscope as well, because rarely if the platelet count is good, there might be something wrong with the way they work. So they might be very big or they might not have any granules or some other mark, marked defect, but they look normal. Um, and then you want to assess secondary hemostasis as a rough and ready measure. So you do your clotting screen and that shows that the PT is normal at 11.5 but the APTT is 45. Now this again gives us quite a clear history. We've got an APTT that's quite prolonged so it's an isolated intrinsic pathway defect here and so we're thinking has she got a factor deficiency or has she got some sort of inhibitor affecting it because she's not as far as I'm aware she's not on any drug she's three it's very unlikely. So we do a 50-50 mix and that shows this correction which means there isn't an antibody or inhibitor getting way of the test. So we're not going to go down the route of a lupus anticoagulant, which can also sometimes present with stuff like bruising. Um, we're looking for a factor deficiency. And she's a girl. And so haemophilia A and B are on the genes for those on the X chromosome. So you normally have to be a, a boy to be affected because you have to have an XY chromosome. Um, or, so in that circumstance, we're thinking that if she has, is genotypically female, that we will have someone who um, is likely not to have a factor eight or nine deficiency. And the most common bleeding disorder in Caucasians, and we didn't actually say what her ethnicity was, but, but even globally, the most common disorder is von Willebrand's disease. And so we're thinking that one. So we're gonna do some extra tests. We're gonna check her factor eight, which is a little bit low, but definitely not as low as a von Willebrand factor antigen at the activity. Now, when we do von Willebrand's testing, it's quite complicated diagnostics because there's lots of different types. There's type one, where the total number of von Willebrand is not being produced very well. There's type two, where it's been produced, but it's not very functional in different ways. And then there's type three, where it's virtually absent. And this is where you have basically a, 
a, a severe haemophilia type picture. In this case, we are thinking that it is low, so the number of von Willebrand in terms of its you know, ratio is 20, and the normal thing would be 50 to 100. And the same goes for all of these results, normal would be 50 to 100. And the activity is also low, but at the same level as the deficiency. So we think they are deficient in von Willebrand factor. And so this would be consistent with a type 1, so a low von Willebrand antigen, um, called type 1 von Willebrand disease. And it's low enough that she probably will need some help with any procedures. If she has any accidents or injuries, she'd need some support. And she may need some further help if she has uh, in, in sort of 10 years' time when she starts having periods. So you need to plan for all that. And that's why she'd be registered to a haemophilia centre um, and be managed for, a long, for her lifelong um, for von Willebrand disease. We're going to move on to case two. If you have any questions about type case one, do let me know. We can cover those at the end, okay? So case two is a bit more of a scary case. We've got a two-week-old infant who's presented collapsed, so um, you know, unconscious, not responsive. And they're rushed into hospital, gone straight to A&E, and the pediatricians who see on arrival so realise that they're not, the baby's not breathing, and they're going to intubate to support the breathing, still alive. And they rush down to a CT and they show a large intracranial bleed. And they, we want to assess both primary and secondary hemostasis. We do a normal plate that counts, so it's likely not to be that. Um, but the PT is 45 and the APT is 50. So this is both an extrinsic and an intrinsic pathway. So it's unlikely that this is something like um, you know, severe haemophilia or something else like that. This is combining both pathways. It could be a very rare disorder where you've got a combined thing, so a five and an eight, or a common pathway defect. But those are very rare, and common things being common, you're thinking this is something acquired. And in this age group, we'd be thinking along the lines of the vitamin K dependent factors, because babies, when they're born, because um, vitamin K is, meta is largely metabolized and absorbed through the evolution of of gut flora and babies don't necessarily have a huge amount of that so it takes a while for vitamin k levels to normalize as a result of that finding um, universally in the uk um, when babies are born they are offered vitamin k injections to try and boost that to reduce the risk of something called vitamin k deficiency bleeding um, which used to affect about five in ten thousand and now is incredibly rare thanks to the use of vitamin k um, but it still crops up from time to time, um, partly because patients refuse or it's not given for one reason or another. Um, uh, and so we go looking for the characteristic vitamin K dependent factors, so 2, 7, 9 and 10. And in this baby, they're all low. So this would be very characteristic of vitamin K deficiency bleeding. Um, and is you know, not, not, not all that uncommon in hospitals. It's still quite rare, but um, crops up a few times per year. So we go to case three. Um, this one is another newborn infant because lots of disorders of um, hemostasis occur quite early in life. You, it's unusual to get someone presenting with a hemophilia or some other significant bleeding disorder at the age of 84. So a newborn infant is reviewed on the postnatal ward at 12 hours of life because they've got some, some prolonged breeding from a heel prick. They were having some sugar levels done just to monitor them. Um, it's an egg donor IVS pregnancy, so they weren't known to have any family history of note. Um, and when they were reviewed, their, their head was quite big and they were having periodic apneas. So they, a full blood count was done, which did show that there was been some blood loss or anemic, but the platelet number is normal. So we're not thinking this is primary hemostasis. We're thinking this is the secondary hemostasis area. And when we do the clotting factors, they're really grossly prolonged. So the PT is plumb normal at 12, but the APT is very prolonged at 120 and the fibrinogen is normal. So we're thinking, again, that we're looking not at the extrinsic pathway, not really at the common pathway, because it's an isolated intrinsic pathway abnormality. We might be thinking this is a fact 12 deficiency, but we've learned already that that isn't associated with a significant bleeding phenotype. And this baby clearly is probably having a, a major intracranial event. So we're thinking this is either factor 11 deficiency, factor 9 deficiency, or factor 8 deficiency. I didn't tell you this is a boy, so they could well be affected. 
and we don't really know the history, so it could well be that the, there's, an inherit, there's a family history here. So given the factor haemophilia A is a lot more common than haemophilia B, which is more common than factor 11 deficiency, we're thinking this is probably a haemophilia B, but we're going to be looking for everything. It could be a type 3 von Willebrand, so we'll be looking for that as well. And when we do the testing, the factor 8 is undetectable, but the factor 9, 11, and 12 are normal. And we've done a VW in there, which is normal. So this would be consistent with haemophilia A, or inherited factor 8 deficiency. Now, there's a huge spectrum of haemophilia A's, because we've learned already that normal would be a factor level of 50% or 50 international units per deciliter plus. Um, and we don't really find that people struggle that much with hemostasis until it gets the levels get very, very low. So we have a severity rating, which puts haemophilia A patients into severe, moderate, and mild. And if you have a factor level of 5% or more, then we think that you're going to have a mild bleeding phenotype. You only need a little bit, but even those guys can sometimes get significant bleeding. They may need support through procedures. They may need support through injuries. Rarely they may get things get problems, but on the whole, they're not going to have as severe problems as other other people. And the key thing that people end up running problems with is spontaneous bleeds, either into the head at birth after a traumatic birth, or even just a normal birth, which can be quite traumatic, or Commonly, the big problem is into joints, so hemarthrosis, where blood gets into the joint, makes it very big, swollen, and blood is very irritative and can lead to significant damage to joints to the point of severe disability within the first two decades of life. So a lot of haemophilia centers will spend a lot of time putting patients onto prophylaxis, so they'll be on regular factor replacement to cover day-to-day -day wear and tear so they don't have bleeds in the first place. And if they do have bleeds, being very aggressive in management and also involving physiotherapists and orthopedic people to manage that joint disease very, very well so people can have long-term ability. But historically, haemophilia patients who survived into adulthood used to be quite severely disabled. But it, with today's prevention strategies, prophylaxis strategies, we're trying to minimize that to the point where that is undetectable. And when it's less than 1%, that's where it goes down to the severe category. And those are people who have spontaneous bleeds quite commonly. And we would often get those onto something to stop it. In this case, this is consistent with severe with a major intracranial bleed. And we need, need to be very quick in managing this, getting some factor, factor replacement into this baby to, to, and then some neurosurgical input to sort out the bleed and try and sort things from there. So this is a scary proposition. It's also the case that got me into hematology in the first place because I used to be a paediatrician in my former life. Case four, we've got 17 minutes, so we're on time. Case four, so in this case, we've got a seven-year-old presenting with gram-negative sepsis. So this is quite a nasty sepsis that often leads to septic shock because gram-negative bugs often lead to third spacing, so difficult to maintain your blood pressure. So quite often they need to go to um, intensive care for ventilation, so intubation and ventilation, so a breathing machine, and inotropic support, so being on pressors to support the blood pressure and allow that heart to pump effectively to get uh, blood round to the tissues. The platelet count is low, so we're thinking, oh, is there an issue with primary hemostasis here? But we're not heard about the bleeding history, and that's the key thing here, um, is you always have to correlate the numbers with what's going on with the patient. So is there bleeding? Is there bruising? It's the first question you're always going to be asking. The blood film shows the occasional fragment, but the clotting screen is also shows a gross abnormality. And given the clinical picture here, we'll be thinking that there's something going on causing gross inflammation and activation of, um, the, uh, of coagulation to try and stop the insult. But it's dysfunctional here and happening in an uncontrolled way. So in this circumstance, we'll be expecting that the lines will be, you know, when they've got arterial lines in or big um, central lines in, they'll be probably oozing from the sites because the platelet count will be low. All the clotting factors will be um, vanished as well to other areas. There'll be a process of uncontrolled clotting, leaving no platelets or factor left over for normal control of hemostasis at other areas. Um, and the D-dimer, so the product, the fibrin degradation product, so when the fibrin clot is formed, you'll have uncontrolled fibrinolysis as well. So you'll get degradation products, and this D-dimer is what you'll see 
in thrombosis. So they're, try they're trying frantically to break down that clot, but it's not working very well. So you get d dimers very high, uh, but it can also happen in, in this condition called DIC, which we talked about earlier. So this is a classic story for DIC, a very profoundly septic patient with gram-negative sepsis, profoundly unwell, so septic shock requiring lots of organ support. And they have this picture of thrombocytopenia, gross coagulopathy, and raised products of fibrin degradation. There are, again, the ISTH, the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, has calculators to look at DIC and gives you a DIC score so you can track progress looking at different parameters dynamically over time. So quite often a hematologist might ask you to look at that over time to see if things are improving. We might, this will be churning through vitamin K, so we'll recommend some vitamin K replacement. But we're going to be quite cautious with clotting factors because we know that the there's a high risk of thrombosis and we want to find that happy balance between the thrombotic potential and the coagulopathic potential. So if they're showing a thrombotic phenotype, but they're not bleeding too badly, we would hold off things that would support things, support sort of product support because FFP, cryo, things like that might make the thrombosis work. We'll be working very much in line with the clinical picture to guide things. However, if they're bleeding, we'll be saying, right, let's support the process. Let's give, um, you know, fibrinogen support, so give cryoprecipitate or fibr fibrinogen concentrate. They're really struggling with, with, the, with the deranged coagulopathy. We'll be giving other things as well, such as FFP, so fresh frozen plasma to try and replace that factor. We're working quite hard to try and get on top of things depending on the clinical picture. And this is a process, really. So it's a consumption coagulopathy. So there's uncontrolled coagulation using up those platelets and clogging factors, leading to organ ischemia, microthrombosis, or even grosser thrombosis versus bleeding at other sites because there's nothing left over. So we move on to case five, um, more into the realms of adulthood here. So a 57-year-old man, he's got deranged LFTs and a significant alcohol history. So we're thinking that he's got some sort of liver disease going on here. But most importantly, always take a bleeding history. He's got no history of bruising or bleeding, but we still do some blood, so it shows him to be mildly anemic with a macrocytosis. White cell counts are okay, but the platelet counts are a little bit low. And the PT's low, sorry, high, and the APT's high, and the fibrinogen's low. So it looks potentially, if you're looking at the, in the wrong lens, you might be thinking, right, is this DIC? You know, the platelet counts low, you know, he's got deranged FTs, something, something's going on. But in the, in the consequence of, of confirmed alcoholic liver disease or chronic liver disease, particularly when it's quite marked, you've got a cirrhotic liver, then you might end up with a picture where the liver is not able to produce its factors. But in hemostasis, we talked already that we have this natural balance between thrombotic, pro-thrombotic factors and anticoagulant factors. You have natural anticoagulants. Um, and so in, if you have a global depression of all those, you end up with something called rebalanced hemostasis, where the platelets are low, but the von Willebrand factors are also a little bit off. The coagulation factors and the anticoagulation factors are balanced. Fibrinolytic factors versus antifibrinolytic factors are all depressed in balanced hemostasis. So even though the numbers, which only measure one side of the equation, are deranged, sometimes even grossly deranged, when you look at the patient, they're not bruising or bleeding. They're in rebalanced hemostasis. And so increasingly we're evolving our mindset in liver disease to understand what is normal for that patient. Because if you chuck in loads of platelets, if you chuck in loads of FFP and tip the scales the wrong way, you might actually end up causing more harm than good. You might cause more issues with um so thrombosis, you might end up causing fluid overload. You might cause more harm than good. So understanding that is, is really important. And you're increasing, because this is a new concept, as doctors going out into the, the field in the next few years, you'll find people who have historically managed these, 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 these numbers rather than the patients in front of them um, with very aggressive FFP, cryo, platelets, and everything else to, to manage procedures. But increasingly, we understand that we don't need to do that. We may be causing more harm than good. And there's increasing uh, evidence and guidelines out there that say in these patients, particularly for low risk procedures, we should not be stepping in. We should not be doing that. We're going to be causing more harm than good. OK, six, we've got an 89 year old who's been well established on warfarin for history of atrial fibrillation. So this is a condition where the heart is fibrillating. And um, will occasionally, because the 
the, the heart chambers aren't moving, you'll get a blood clot and it'll pump uh, randomly and that blood clot will be thrown off and cause a stroke or something else. So you want to manage that and, and thin their blood to stop that happening. But in this circumstance, they presented with a, an acute kidney injury and warfarin is largely excreted by the kidney. Um, and you're worried a bit that that may have accumulated. And they've presented with bruising and bleeding. So you check their INR, their full blood count is normal, but their INR is 11. And normally in patients, you're aiming for an INR of two to three, which is two to three times the PT of a normal person, as it were. Um, so we think that basically they've, they've been taking their warfarin. It's accumulated because it's not being excreted. And we could test their factor levels. So their factor two, seven, nine, and 10 would be low. But... We don't really need to. The history here is very suggestive. We would manage the, the warfarin toxicity or accumulation due to AKI. So this is very much targeted to the patient in front of you. You can give antidotes for warfarin. We've got lots of them. We can give vitamin K, which reverses all this. Um, but if we give loads and loads of it, we'll be swamping the body and it'll take a long time to get warfarin. So we might go low and slow and give one to two milligrams and then reassess after four to six hours when it has a chance to to bed it takes that long to sort of disperse in the body and have an action and two milligrams would probably be enough to get this down you might need another further dose to get it further down but if you gave them 10 milligrams you probably couldn't re them for weeks and they'd need some sort of cover if they were high risk from from their af however if they're bleeding you want to do something there and then so we give something called pcc or prothrombin concentrate so we it's basically uh, either a uh, a three or four factor concentrate geared towards these factors and can reverse um, the, the bleeding phenotype within you know minutes. Um, and so we will give that as either octoplex or beriplex, depending on where you work. And we can give that as an emergency reversal if we need to. Case seven, uh, so it's a 23 year old woman presenting with confusion, renal dysfunction. She's noted to be anemic with a very marked thrombocytopenia. And the blood film shows loads of fragments, but the clotting screen is plumb normal. So this is pre predominantly uh, a, a, a platelet issue. And this is actually an issue of TTP, which we talked about earlier, where you, your von Willebrand is, normally forms multimers. So it forms like little chains that go off and work their action. And those are cleaved into the right length by this enzyme called Adam TS13. You can get a deficiency of Adam's TS13 either because you're born with a deficiency called congenital or you have an antibody that destroys Adam's TS13. So it's an acquired antibody mediated um, Adam's TS13 deficiency where that doesn't happen. So these long multimers, and you may remember that um, the von Willebrand factor binds to platelets. So that platelets all bind to those very long multimers and they cause these huge great things that go off and cause microthrombi, which cause renal dysfunction, brain clots, um, and they consume all those platelets, and they can also cleave off all the, and they also block off into the uh, microvasculature, and the red cells going through get shorn into pieces, so you end up with hemolysis as well. And this is a thing that is life-threatening within a day or two. Um, I think that was the last case. Right, uh, does anyone have any questions? So I think we've got some in the chat. Um, can you see yeah, the I chat? Can, yeah. I can indeed. So I can see Dr. Addy. Um, yeah. In those with severe renal impairment, or if DOACs are contraindicated, e.g. due to a lupus anticoagulant, who are at high breeding, uh, bleeding risk, on the basis of preliminary Pacific studies on could inhabitants of factor 11 have the potential to replace warfarin? Okay. So that's a really interesting question. So you're basically saying... So we've got new agents coming out, um, which work in completely different ways. Um, they haven't been explored in any sense for prevention of thrombosis. In fact, the latest preliminary things coming out from Pacific and the uh, ancillary studies is actually that they have actually halted those studies because they're not proving to be efficacious. So having more thrombo thrombotic risk than anything else. Um, so those aren't really coming through yet uh, as a thing. Um, we're always looking for new targets. Warfarin is a tricky drug. You have to monitor it. It can accumulate. But in, in end-stage renal failure, it is currently the only thing we can use. Um, we ha are looking ever more at um, when we can use half dose to reduce stroke in uh, people who have um, severe renal impairment. But as it currently stands, the only data is around warfarin. There is increasingly trying to use a pixaban 
trying to use low-liquid heparin with some anti-10A levels to try and understand it. But we're not there yet. If you've got AF or uh, an indication for anticoagulation, the only thing really at this current moment in time is warfarin. <clears throat> we hold great hope for the future in terms of rebalancing agents, in terms of other things we can use, but nothing is there yet. I hope that answers your question there. Second question um, is, uh, can hypercalcemia, I think you're trying to say there, in some cancers contribute to hypercalcemia? Um, yes, there's a huge amount going on in cancers that lead to procoagulant states. Um, <coughs> it's mostly to do with um, localized effects. It can be to do, to do with cytokine effects, which is probably the most of it, where they lead to a, a hyperinflammatory state that leads to a procoagulant state, because that's part of Virchow's triad, and you can get lots of uh, cytokines and uh, hyperviscosity symptoms as well. Uh, you can that. But hypercalcemia, when it's present, can not help, but it wouldn't be the, the sole answer. <coughs> Forgive me. Really? Oh, from my finger. And then we got one from Rajat Roy. Um, may you kindly clarify the difference between an anticoagulant and an antiplatelet? That's a really great question. And I haven't really touched on this today. So an antiplatelet works on platelet aggregation or um, platelet adhesion. So it works in primary hemostasis, whereas an anticoagulant will work on the secondary hemostasis. So it will work on the clotting cascade um, in one of the ways we've described in this lecture, actually. And um, basically... Secondary hemostasis is more of a factor in venous thrombosis. Um, so that's where you have a chance for the blood is flowing a little bit slower. You can get um, sort of an easier time of things to form a clot. Um, and so if you have a venous thromboembolism, it's normally due to something happening in the secondary hemostasis pathway, and therefore that's going to be more efficacious. So in DVTs, PEs, um, trying to reduce the viscosity of turbid blood in AF, that will, that, that will help there. Whereas in arterial disease, so peripheral vascular disease, or in um, where you're thinking peripheral vascular disease, or um, a stroke has occurred in the arterial tree, it's more likely that the, the benefit will come from affecting primary hemostasis because blood is flowing under much more sheer strength and often that's more of the, the difference. So in stroke prevention, in uh, vascular disease, in arterial disease, an antiplatelet is much more helpful. Whereas in venous disease, so venous thromboembolic disease, um, a uh, anticoagulant is more helpful. Does that answer your question, Dr. Roy? Or Mr. Roy? Mr. Roy, I don't know. Not sure how long it might uh, come for that to come up on the messages, but I'm sure he'll get back to you. That's okay. Um, does anyone else have anything else that I left clear? I didn't, thank you. Um, <laughs> if that's come up. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions or anything else that they've come across that they wanted to ask about? Because cases are uh, the way that we all learn from time to time. Uh, or any other feedback that you would like to, to just uh, state? <laughs> And we'll put the link um, for the uh, feedback in the chat as well. Yes, so oh. if um, there are no other questions, um, then I just want to thank you very much, Dr. Clark. I'm sure everyone um, enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and I'll post the link now in the, for the feedback so that um, we can work out what people like and what to carry on doing in the future. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you very much for presenting for us. It was a very, very good talk. Thank you so much. So happy. Always, always happy to have. I hope it was helpful.